Hey, before we go any further and we dig into God's word today, I want to invite you to help me welcome everybody that's watching online today, everybody watching from Eunice City Jail. Would you give them a big, loud, come on, make sure they hear. I have family that watches us. We have God's family that watches us. People who are homebound who really can't be here, not just snuggied up because they're scared of the rain. We see you. Hey, we're in the middle of a series called Scriptures That Speak. And, and last week I gave you a memory verse. If you missed it, it's, it's one of the core scriptures. Uh, I'm, I'm challenging my children to learn some scriptures with me. I'm, I'm challenging myself to learn some new scriptures. I'm trying to quote scripture every morning to refresh it and remember it. Colossians 3.23, it's not in your notes. You're gonna have to look it up all on your own. Colossians 3.23 says, in whatever you do, Work at it with all, very important, like your whole. Love the Lord your God with all of your. So work at it with all. Why? Because God doesn't respond to partial obedience. Work at it with all of your heart as unto the Lord and not to men. See, Jesus laid this foundation that the apostle Paul echoes to the church of Colossae. He says, In Matthew 5 and 6, he's beginning with all these beatitudes and he's preaching this sermon on the mountain. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, not just financially impoverished, but those who humble themselves. Blessed are the meek and the humble and and blessed are those who don't seek their own righteousness. Jesus goes through all these things and and then in Matthew chapter 6, as we've labeled it, Jesus begins to get into things like prayer, prayer. And fasting, the lost spiritual discipline of people that say they believe in Jesus but don't really give anything up for him. The fasting and, and praying and, and then he talks about not being bitter and being forgiving. And then Jesus talks about being for giving, which is really annoying and overwhelming. And Jesus goes as far as to say, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because heavenly treasure actually outlives you. And then he gets down and Jesus Christ has the audacity to tell people in 2023 with all of our bills and concerns and ambitions and desires, stop worrying. Can you add a day to your life? By worrying? Nope, you're probably losing some. Just trying to help somebody. (laughs) Do not worry as if worry is a sin. And I don't know about you, but if I just read Matthew 5 and Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, I just see a whole lot of things that I'm not very good at. And all of a sudden, I'm not quite as confident of who I thought I was. (laughs) But thank God. We labeled it as verse 33. Jesus said, you know what? All that stuff, seek first the kingdom. And if you missed our series, Kingdom Came in December, I wanna invite you to find time throughout your week to go back and listen to that because it laid the foundation for this entire year. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. This isn't a Southern Baptist or a United Pentecostal conversation. Once saved, never saved. It's not, that's not what we're talking about. This is a both and conversation. <laughs> By the way, the Assemblies of God gets some stuff wrong too. I'm not just throwing those two under the bus. It's just the extreme ends. This is about you not seeking your own self-righteousness. And this is also about you not being comfortable in your sin because we're supposed to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when you do that, then, there's a lot of and then statements in the word of God. There's a lot of if then statements because God gives us some responsibility in this thing. Even though we can't work our way to him, then all these things shall be added unto you. Let me give you a a, a statement I believe that the Lord gave me. What we do with God's word, I said it partially last week, I wanted to give it to you in your notes this week. What we do with God's word will determine what we do with our lives. I really believe that. What you do with God's word 
will determine what you decide to do with the rest of your life. And some of you are in a place where you can look at your life and you can see where it's not or where it is because of what you did or didn't do with God's word. And some of you maybe are in a great place and you haven't really thought about this. But here's the second statement. What you do with your life will determine what you do for eternity. I think the church has gotten away from, the, because of the brow beating and the, the Bible knocking and the hell fire and brimstone that pushed so many people away, we have gone all the way over to the other end of the spectrum where we only tell people what they want to hear. We only give them book titles that they'll buy. You know, like, you're not going to go to Walmart and purchase a book that says the wrath of God. No, 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 it's going to be your best life now. <laughs> If you had the choice between hellfire and happiness, you're going to buy happiness because the devil knows what sells. And these, what we do with our, I think we need to get back to a place where we understand that this is a heaven or hell issue. That seeking God for our lives and our families, that's a heaven or hell issue. Come on, church, that sharing your faith, giving and serving, that's a heaven or hell issue. Fasting and praying, it's a heaven or hell issue. The example that you set in society with people that know that you believe in God and go to new hope, it's a heaven or hell issue. Because if what we do, watch how this works, if what we do with our lives, I'm sorry, what we do with God's word determines what we do with our lives, and what we do with our lives determines where we spend eternity or what we do for eternity, then really, just so everybody knows I'm not preaching blasphemy, what we do with God's word determines what we do for eternity. With that in mind, I wanna go into my life verse. One that transformed my mentality to the way that I lived. I wanna talk to you today about the secret content. Turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter four. I'll be right back. I tricked our camera guys. They weren't ready. I'm still here. It's okay. I didn't go anywhere. Talk about the secret content. Pastor Weston found this cool briefcase for me. I want to address this very misused, misappropriated passage of scripture and the one that I'm gonna tell you first is not actually the life verse. This is just the one that everybody likes to quote and appropriate personally. Philippians 4, 13. Oh, you got it. Like, I know that one. Okay, hang on, good for you. Let everybody else learn it. Every time I, never mind. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Some of y'all are like, oh, that's in the Bible? <laughs> Listen, this verse is written on the wrist of people getting drunk just like everybody else. <laughs> it's my bad. Y'all didn't know I was gonna go there today. But, but this verse is in, in, in gray or white across the eye black of athletes while they're cussing the other team out. This is the verse that everybody likes to quote whenever they're thinking about how much money they're gonna make this year or, 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 or how many promotions they're gonna get or how many followers they're gonna receive or how much influence they're gonna be. And they like to say, oh, I can do all things through Christ. I can make money, money, money. I can be successful. I can be influential. I can accomplish my goals and my desires and I can be elevated in front of others other people because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength but if you think this is about you then you're probably not in Christ because that's not the context of this verse in Acts chapter 16 you don't have to go there I'll just tell you what's going on you can go read it later or you can go watch it on our YouTube channel subscribe to the church's YouTube channel Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul is on his missionary journey. And the Bible says he wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow him to. And then he wanted to go to some random place called Bithynia. And he wouldn't even let him go to Bithynia. 
So he ended up in Troas, which is not as bad as, Yo- never mind. It's, he ended up in a place he didn't want to be. And, and while he was in a place that he didn't want to be, waiting on God to tell him something he probably didn't want to do, he had a vision. You ever been in a place you didn't want to be, waiting on God to tell you what he wanted you to do, even though you knew what you wanted to do, you just wasn't where you were? And I actually said it appropriately, because I have. And all of a sudden, in a place he didn't want to be, waiting to hear something he probably didn't want to know, God gave him a vision of a Macedonian man. A vision of a man, and I could just see light and armor shining. I mean, he was dressed in something that would allow Paul to know this man is from Macedonia. And so Paul wakes up and he says, I know why we couldn't go to Asia, Bithynia too. No, he didn't say, he just, he woke up and he said, hey, we're supposed to go to Macedonia. So he went to the Macedonian area and ended up in Philippi, Philippi, and he's looking for a man. You're looking like a man. All right, he's looking for somebody that fits the vision. The problem is there weren't enough public believers in Philippi for them to have a synagogue. What, what was actually the fact is that there weren't enough men in Philippi of Jewish descent and or faith to stand up and need a place to gather together. And when the men don't rise, God raises up the women anyways. In fact, he'll raise you up whether the men rise or not because God's not interested in what your DNA is or what your chromosomes are when it comes to him using you in the kingdom of God. Now, he gave them to you, and I'll come back to that in here in a little while, but he couldn't find any men, and there was no synagogue, so this vision that he had was not coming to pass, and Paul met a woman named Lydia who was praying with some other women down by the river. Other ri- All right, all right. <laughs> In a van, that's not, she didn't have a van, she was just praying down by the river. And then Paul's going through town and he's sharing, I woke five people up, I was like, what? He was, he's praying and, he, and, he's, and he's walking around through town and this little devil girl, she's a little slave girl, she's yelling stuff at him and, 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 and telling him things that actually he's, she's just telling everybody why he's there. It really, she's not even saying anything like that offensive, it's just annoying. And Paul irrationally annoyed, turns around and casts the devil out of him. Now, God didn't tell him to do that, but I think God knew he would. He casts the devil not out, of, not out of sympathy or compassion, out of frustration. He casts the devil out of her, and then he's thrown in prison. All this right there in Acts chapter 16. Him and Silas sitting in prison at midnight. All right, hang on. Back up with me. If I were sitting in prison at midnight in a place I didn't want to be because God told me to do something I didn't want to do and gave me a vision of a Macedonian man and I ain't had nothing but women problems ever since I got to Philippi. I'd be a little frustrated. Not Paul. Paul and Silas in the middle of the night are singing praises to God. They are worshiping despite what happened. When you learn to worship despite what happened to you, when you learn to praise despite your pain, when you learn to open up your mouth despite what you feel in your heart, then God will begin to open up opportunities that you didn't know you were about to have. When they started praising despite their problem, when they started worshiping despite what happened the bible says the chains fell off and i don't know who's bound up this morning but i know if you are you need to start worshiping over what happened and you need to start praising over your problem because in the instant that they were praising the gates to the prison cell that they found themselves stuck in flew open according to the word of the lord because when you worship the word comes to you And the Philippian jailer is about to kill himself. And Paul says, wait, we're all here. I don't know about you. God takes the chains off me and opens up the door 
Silas about to find out how, Chris, how fast Chris still is. Not Paul. Paul saw the opportunity. And he looked at the Philippian jailer. And the jailer asked him a question. What must I do to be saved? Did you know that Paul didn't say anything about Sunday school? He didn't say nothing about catechism. Can I go there? He didn't say nothing about how many psalms he needed to know or how many times he needed to pray rosaries. Paul said, only believe. Boy, that'll mess your doctrine up right there. You and your whole family shall be saved. The vision of the Macedonian man, a Philippian jailer. Paul wanted to go to Asia. He wanted to go to Bithynia. But God had a man that he wanted to save because he had a family underneath that man that was about to be transformed. And when you take that family with Lydia and the women and you put them together, now you have a Philippian church that is ready to have an impact in the community. Oh, I over-preached it and stayed there too long. Good thing we have more time between services. (laughs) Paul in a Roman prison, writing to the church in Philippi that's not supposed to even be there. He's on death row in Rome. And he writes a letter. And he says my life verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Out of prison, I have learned to be content. No matter my circumstances, whatever is going on, I have learned to be content. Verse 12, and I know the secret, let me show you today the secret content. It's going to blow some of your minds away. Jesus said to his disciples, To you I have made known, given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. The secret of content. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. It almost sounds like a marriage vow. As if your relationship with God is likened unto your covenant with your spouse. I have learned the secret of being content in any, might I add, and every situation, whether I'm well fed or fasting, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can worship over my worry. I'm going to hurt myself again today. I can praise over my problem. I can be disciplined over that demonic desire. I can endure this immoral, unfair opportunity and or instance. I can. Can It has nothing to do with self-glorification and everything to do with who God is supposed to be in our lives. I was listening this past week to the Grow Leader, Grow Leader podcast. I try to listen to other things on leadership and even business and corporate America. I try to listen to 
another sermon almost every week. I try to listen to another preacher. I don't want to just preach. And I try to listen to, to actually digest, not to just rewrite it and preach it to you, but sometimes I'll, I have to share the things that impact me. The Grow Leader podcast, predominantly written for pastors or church leaders, but certainly applicable to any leader of influence or executive or business owner even employees with some leadership capacity and or influence within the job. And in this podcast, Pastor Chris Hodges is speaking and he's talking about how he used to compare himself to other ministries and he used to compare his city to other cities and, and the way he preached to other pastors and he, and he tried this style and he tried that style and, and he was going through all of the, the issues with not being content in his calling. And he went to a meeting and it was round tables, other leaders and pastors in the room and I don't know who to give credit to because he didn't say a name. So we, he heard someone in the room say, it doesn't even remember the context, he just remembers the statement, I am satisfied with my portion. I am satisfied with my portion. And Chris Hodges, who has planted multiple campuses and the leader of association of uh, relational churches and planted campuses all across the United States, mover and shaker in the state of Alabama and the United States of America on behalf of the kingdom of God, hundreds of thousands of people watching and listening on a weekly basis, little Baton Rouge boy, that didn't like to talk to people, he just liked the counting numbers at LSU. See, God has to send missionaries like us all. I'm satisfied with my portion. I'm satisfied with the street I live on. I'm satisfied with my spouse. I'm satisfied with my children. See, I don't compare my children to other children. I care about other children but they're not mine. I'm not gonna compare my son and my daughters to what other children are or are not doing. It doesn't matter. As for me and my house, in a good way or a bad way, I don't want them to grow up with a complex of comparison like everybody in here has. I'm not gonna compare my wife who had those three children for me to somebody else's wife or some single woman. I'm not gonna compare my family to somebody else's family. I'm not gonna compare my house to somebody else's house. I'm not comparing my vehicle to somebody. I'm not comparing our community with somebody else's community or our church with somebody else's church. I have learned, God help me, to be satisfied with my job, my place, my people, my God-given provision. Whether I was in a rent house in nowhere, East Texas, or I was over here where all my children have a bedroom and they're not fighting over who left the light on and closing piles. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. I was just as content when I was in the church parsonage where I could sit on the toilet, warm up the shower, and brush my teeth at the same time. That's a small bathroom, y'all. Because what I have does not give me contentment. I've learned to be satisfied with my portion. You know what I've learned? I've learned I will never preach like T.D. Jakes, no matter how, tr how hard I try. I will never play the keyboard like Clint Brown. I will never have the following of Stephen Furtick. And I will never be as nice as Joel Osteen. That's funny, that's funny. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Because that's not my portion. That's not what God has for me. Now listen, I'm not talking about being satisfied with less than God's best. I, I'm certainly not talking about becoming settled in any area of your life. Here's the two ends of the spectrum. Most people are either never content or way too complacent. Many of us, we're either, we're either never like, you, you, can't, you, ever, you can't make them happy. If you've never said it, it's you. I'm just. Maybe you've made the statement, oh, I just, I just can't get happy. 
I just can't stay happy. I just can't be happy. That's not something wrong with everything and everybody else. That's something wrong inside of us. It's two ends of the spectrum. I'm either never content or I'm way too complacent. And I'm not talking about being comfortable in sin. I'm not talking about being okay with living under God's standard. I'm not talking about you being able to go out into the community and look like everybody else, live like everybody else, say you believe in Jesus, but be seen as no different at Mardi Gras. I done gone there early this year. Walmart, the one put up the king cakes. They started Mardi Gras. I didn't start Mardi Gras during the fast. I will flip these king cakes over. <laughs> Jesus turned temple tables. Get. This place shall not be at dinner, Roberts. <laughs> shall turn Walmart into a house of God. I'm not talking about being too complete. Look, I, the, our staff knows this. My wife knows this. I tend to lean this way. Always looking to the next thing, the next season. A hundred things going right. I'll tell you the one thing not. It's a gift. <laughs> My bride, she kind of over here. I see sunshine <laughs> until she's tired and hungry. <laughs> see, I believe this. I believe that you can be ambitious and content. If you're so ambitious that you're not enjoying the journey, you may want to go watch the ruthless elimination of hurry. It's really not that hard to say. <laughs> you probably need to spend more time with God this past week. I didn't skip these on purpose. They're in your bulletin right at the top. They're in your notes. But I just want to remind you of the four objectives that we have for this series that you would get in God's word. 80% of resolutions on January 1 are broken by February 1. This shouldn't be a resolution. It should be a recommitment that you would get in God's word. Hear me. If you're not as hungry for God's word as you are for food, then your priorities are out of place. If you don't desire to study and learn and hear and read and memorize and absorb the word of God, as much as you think about what you're gonna eat, then you should probably be fasting some things that realigns your priorities. And may I even challenge whether your salvation is as confident and secure as God desires for it to be. Well, that sounds, no, 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 this is a both and conversation. It's by grace that we've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, we should work out our salvation daily in fear and trembling, and we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. See, if you're not hungry, because blessed is he who hunger and thirsts for righteousness, then you're probably not hearing God's voice. If you're not hearing God's voice, you're probably not connected to his presence. If you're not connected to his presence, it's probably because I can look at your schedule and he's nowhere in it. Because you're not going to unintentionally grow in Christ. You're going to aimlessly entertain yourself. This is not in your notes, but I think it's worth writing down. You can either aimlessly entertain yourself or you can intentionally anoint yourself, but you can't do both. And when you do those things, you'll discover God's plan. Because you can be ambitious and content. Here's my final statement in this passage because comparison kills contentment. And I don't believe that most people are discontent because they're so ambitious. I believe that most people are discontent because they're comparing themselves, their lives, their spouse, their children, their income, their home, their vehicle to everything and everybody else. You ever been perfectly fine? And then just 
out of habit, pick up your phone. And teenagers, they, they jump on TikTok or Snapchat or some of you are still on Instagram. Old people, you get on Facebook. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm with you <laughs> right there. That was funnier in first service. I'll try again in third. <laughs> and you just begin to aimlessly scroll for no apparent reason just because that's your habit. In fact, whenever you sit around without your phone, you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be, oh yeah, I would normally aimlessly scroll right now, but I'm fasting that and it feels weird. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> do you know how many hours we aimlessly waste entertaining ourselves instead of intentionally seeking God first and his righteousness with all of our heart. You can't do both. And all of a sudden, you're scrolling on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or Snapchat, and all of a sudden, you're tempted by something that you weren't even thinking about 10 minutes ago. And instead of just getting off and closing it or telling somebody, because you shouldn't even be on TikTok because there is way too much access and not nearly enough accountability, and I'll just go down that road and die on it. Instead of getting off of there because you know that no temptation has overcome you except such as common to man, but God is faithful, and with the temptation, he will allow and able an escape so that you may be able to bear it. But instead of escaping, you try to endure, and then you get stuck in what you used to be saved from. Or... Instagram, Facebook, you start comparing your face to somebody else's face or your family to somebody else's family or your reality to somebody else's highlight reel and all of a sudden, because of comparison, you're no longer content. You're anxious, you're frustrated, you wish that your husband was that kind to you or you wish that your wife would dress like that or you wish that your children would do that or you wish that you had that job or it'd be nice if I could buy that vehicle or when, it must be good if the pastor lives in that place. You were perfectly content 10 minutes ago, but you are aimlessly entertaining yourselves and now you are overwhelmed with comparison and the comparison is killing the contentment that God has called you to because you are not satisfied with your portion, incessantly comparing it to other people's portion. And if you could change one thing in the second week of January, you could learn to be satisfied. I came across a study of global standards recently. It opened my eyes. I'm not talking, not American standards, not South Louisiana standards or Southern United States standards, but global standards. Did you know that if you can read, you are one of the most highly educated people in the world according to global standards? If you can write, that increases. If you can read and or write in multiple languages, it increases even more. Did you know that in most places in the world, to work five days a week so that you can provide housing, health care, food, clothing, clean drinking water, and you only have to work five days a week, and we have a society that's trying to move the work week to four days because that's all the kids that only had to go to school for nine months a year and got 17 breaks within the nine months, and all they cared about was getting their junk done so that they could do whatever they wanted to. I can't figure out why America's in the situation that it's in, but that ain't even a sermon today. Did you know that if you are one person and or two people providing for a home of three to four people by only working five days a week to provide for seven days, you are an elite individual according to global standards. If you make, this blew my mind, if you make $37,000 a year, in total income or as a family, 37,000 a year. You are in the 96th percentile of the richest people in the world. Let me give you some rich people problems. I flooded my side by side. 
The scope on my rifle is not working correctly. My computer crashed. My four wheeler won't start. I can't get coverage on my cell phone. Stupid Verizon, you have car trouble. You have flight delays. You have electrical outages. You have low water pressure. Because people don't understand the difference between a drip and a running sink. They turn my water off. That's a rich people problem. To live in a culture where people get frustrated because they turn water off for a day or two to save the pressure or repair a line. You need to remember that there are millions of people who walk miles a day to carry water into a village so that they can cook and clean and hopefully boil all the bacteria out enough that it doesn't kill their children whenever they drink it. And most of those people carry it on their head and most of them are women. They can't imagine a place where you just turn water on to make grass and rice grow and you just let clean water go out onto the ground. See, there are four contentment killers. Comparison. Comparison causes envy. When you begin to envy somebody, you need to remember that is one of the seven deadly sins. And you need to stop. Take that thought captive. Make it obedient unto Christ. Envy will kill your contentment. You ever notice that it doesn't matter what you get, you always want something new? It doesn't matter how nice it is, you always want the next thing. <laughs> no matter what you buy, somebody else comes up, oh yeah, <laughs> look at this. Like, ah, where's the receipt? Greed, because we're greedy. We have so much globally. No, maybe not compared to Dallas way up north like Shreveport, you know. It's <laughs> and when you, when you begin to compare and you become envious and you become greedy, it causes us to be ungrateful, dissatisfied, discontent, unpleasable. And instead of acknowledging that it's a problem in you, you think it's a problem around you or in people around you. And instead of allowing God to fix you, you try to fix them. And you think a new job in a new place or a new girl or a new boy or new children. <laughs> that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> Let me show you a picture. I got to tell this story quickly because I want to get you into God's presence. Not that you're not already there because he's been here. This is a really cool picture of a buck that you can't shoot. I, I can't shoot him. Nobody can shoot him. His name is Hollywood. It's fitting, right? He is a 200 class typical buck, except for this one little thing he's got here, the little crab claw he's got on his front horn. I mean, he should be, he's got a tag in his ear. Like this is, you don't get to shoot this guy, okay? He's in a pen. He has everything he wants to eat. He has apples. I mean, how many deer get to just eat apples every day? He's got all the protein he wants. why his horns look like, dirt. you know? If you want, if you want bigger muscles you can eat more protein like like hollywood I mean, he has every he should be called king solomon because he's got like 30 wives <laughs> i mean you can see the does like in his pen there's no other buck in his pen it's just hollywood and all these women all the food he wants all the women he wants he's got it made right that's tiktok all right so it, but but when we were there i found this interesting there was this doe, and it was a native doe outside of the pen. And she apparently was in heat. If you don't know what that means, ask your mama later. The doe was in heat, and, and Hollywood, with all of this that he had, came running down from the pen, 
Stop asking your mama, pay attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood came running down from the pen trying to get to the one dough that wasn't his. The native dough outside of the pen. Not knowing, see, here's what he didn't know. If Hollywood gets out of his pen, he can never go back in again. Because of laws in the state of Texas connected to multiplying and achieving his purpose. If he were to get out of that pen and have anything to do, even if he were just get out, much less have anything to do with that native born deer, he could never be treated, he could never be taken care of. If he gets sick, they can't do anything about it. If he gets injured, they can't touch him. They cannot bring him back in to the lifestyle that he currently has because he stepped out of it. And the only reason that he stepped out was because he didn't realize what he had. And he wanted the one thing that he wasn't supposed to have. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let marriage, uh oh. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexual, immoral, and adulterous. Now, listen, I, I'm not talking about going back and fixing things that you can't do anything about. I'm talking about from this point forward. And God is still God of redemption, salvation, forgiveness. But wherever you are right now at the beginning of this year, you need to understand that he's also a God of righteousness, justice, purity, Hey, by the way, while I'm on it, um, you don't get to redefine marriage. It's already been defined. God defined it in Genesis. Jesus confirmed it in the Gospels. Marriage is a union between one biological male, XY, with one biological female, XX. And I'll go ahead and say it. This, I mean, no disrespect. I pray for the man and the administration, but it doesn't matter what the president signs or where he signs it or what Congress passes. This word shall never pass away, and it doesn't matter what policy see you sign and all the church said oh wait I set you up verse 5 mm. clap again and while we're talking about marriage between Jesus and one another, by the way, because if you're single, you're married to Jesus. And if you'll cheat on Jesus, then you'll cheat on. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You can't give up enough compared to what I've already given. And if you knew the plans that I had for you, then there's nowhere that you wouldn't go and nothing that you wouldn't do. Because as long as I am with you, says the Lord, you should be confident in whatever you have, wherever you are, and whoever it is with. So the Apostle Paul, with marriage in mind and money and material possessions in mind, says in verse 6 so we can confidently say that our stuff is not our helper our possessions don't make our identity our job is not our success but the Lord is my helper I will not fear what can man do to me what can the economy do to me what can the cost of living do to me what can the increase of inflation do to me? What can supply and demand do to me? What can men's policies do to me? What could people in authority do to me? If God is for me and God is with me, then nothing can come against me. Paul says, I have learned to be content. No matter my circumstances. 
plenty, want, hungry, full. I've learned the secret, Paul says, to being content. I, it's bigger than me. I can't do it without you. I can't get through it without you. It's overwhelming if I think it's up to me. Sorrow may last for a night, but I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. In fact, God, I, while I'm thinking about it, I, I think it's through my weakness that your strength is perfected. I think it's that you take the foolish things to confound the wise. I can do all things. I want to give you a declaration as we close today. See, they said they believed, but they weren't willing to confess because they loved the glory of man more than they loved the glory of God. So Paul wrote to the church in Rome and he said, confess with your mouth the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. So today, I, I'm inviting you to confess. You don't have to shout it. You don't have to scream it. You might want to write it and you might want to do this every morning. Lord, see that's a confession of surrender. Lord, help me be content with my portion.